Andrew, good afternoon. Hi. How are you? I'm good, thank you. It's been a it's been a long while since we met in person. I, I want to take us back to around 2012-13. We were with uh, Louisa Wong of Bolly Associates. Um, I was working on the buy side on behalf of Recruit Holdings. We'd uh, just acquired her business, quite substantial search business in uh, China and Southeast Asia. And you joined us for lunch, and we talked about all things um, China and how to scale in that very complex market. So, yeah, um, great, really great exciting, to see you again. exciting market. I think at one stage we had about sixteen hundred people in various offices in, around China. So it was a big operation for us. That was in time. Not, incredible, incredible. Yeah, and Martin Nichols, a mutual friend, re reconnected us for um, this podcast with recruitment transactions. The theme is around mergers and acquisitions in the recruitment and staffing industry. And I really can't think of um, a better example um, than yourself, someone who, you know, through your experiences with, with Morgan and Banks and TMP and Monster, Talent2 and other ventures that you've been, been part of, involved in, invested in. You have so much knowledge, so much insight, um, uh, probably, you know, deals that, that went right and, and deals that went wrong. And, and I think, you know, we, we'd be lying if, if we were telling viewers that it's always uh, a great story and a pot of pot of uh, you know gold at the end of the rainbow with every with every M and A. Sometimes they don't work. Um, you learn more think, from the deals that go wrong. Trust me. Exactly, exactly. So thank you for joining us. And perhaps I could um, start by asking you a question, which which is um, I think is an interesting one, and it's around your transition from being an actor in in the UK into um, recruitment in in, in Australia and, and co-founding Morgan and Banks, and and how did acting help you in any shape or form with your uh, recruitment and, and staffing career? Well, I think it's to focus too much on acting probably is a bis, bit misrepresentation uh, because but the most interesting thing when I reflect back is I was a misfit in the sense that I did a year of medicine, then applied biology, then I dropped out of university in England, I immigrated to Australia, I then did two years of acting, then ran a restaurant and blah, blah, blah. And so you get the idea that I knew I was motivated, I had talent, but I didn't know where I was going. And I think it's kind of ironic that I end up being one of the principals along with, you know, uh, maybe a couple of dozen people around the world that really got seriously into recruitment together with Michael Page and Robert Walters, who I know, and James. Um, and so interesting that a misfit who didn't find what he really wanted to do until he was 29 ends up helping for the rest of his career other people find out what they really want to do. Um, in terms of acting, of course, if you've done a couple of you know seasons of Shakespeare and you've played a spear carrier and a, and a witch and a few other things on the opera house stage, you don't have nerves about speaking in public. And I think that helps uh, because obviously, you know, public companies have to present. But frankly, when you're pitching to a client, uh, you've got to be able to, you know, string your words together and be persuasive and tell them what you're going to say, say it, and then tell them what you said. And all of that training comes out of acting. So, you know, uh, I didn't have much fear of, uh, of, of making, standing up and making a point. <laughs> Get it. And so Morgan and Banks, can you tell us a little bit about perhaps where you, where you, where you met Jeff, um, you know, how that business grew and, and you know, perhaps how your roles were, were, were different. Were, were you overlapping in some senses or was it quite clear from the start, you know, Jeff did this and, and Andrew did this. How did that all develop? Well, I ended up, when I came back to Australia, having worked in HR. So why did I go into recruitment? I'd worked for Halliburton, Brown and Root in Norway, England and Texas. And I'd recruited together with a bunch of other people, about 7,000 people all around the world to do with the North Sea oil boom. And I okay. noticed that, frankly, the recruiting businesses that came to us to service our needs were not very professional. And, you know, they photocopied resumes and wanted to charge me 15%. And in the end, I put a team together that did a better job. So that's why I went into recruitment, came back to Australia in 1980 um, and joined Slade Consulting. And that's where I cut my teeth four years and Morgan was a competitor and after four and after four years with Slade long story Jeff and I had a deal and at the end of four years that deal didn't sort of materialize which which is fine he made me then think about what well, maybe I should do my own thing and uh, I went out and I thought well, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a Brit but I've been in Australia not very long you know on and off four or five years I need a partner and um, 
I remember Warren Buffett saying, if you're going to choose a partner, don't choose a friend, choose someone who complements your skills. And Morgan uh, was more sales and marketing and pharmaceutical recruitment. I was more engineering, accounting, uh, science, sort of left brain versus right brain. And, and also, one of the tests for me of a good competitor was whether I could ring his clients or their clients, her clients, and get a, pe get a meeting. And I noticed that whenever I tried to ring Morgan's clients and say, you know, I understand you're happy with the recruitment services you use, but you really should let me come and tell you a bit about what we do and maybe you can compare, you know, some sort of compelling sales pitch I'd usually get in the door, not with Morgan's clients. So I thought, well, he must be good. So I took him to lunch and I headhunted him, I suppose you'd say, and he'd been in a company for 15 years and was ready to move. And so in early 1985, we started Morgan Banks. Um, and there were four of us, and then there was eight of us, and then there was 12 of us, and then suddenly there was 50 of us, and by 1998, there was 2,000 of us. And, uh, you know, you, you wonder how that kind of happens. But back to your question, um, we kept changing our roles, but we'd always find a very good, equal distribution of, of, uh, of sort of duty. So for a start, We'd focus on sectors. As I said, I had banking, engineering, construction, left, what you'd call medical left brain. And he'd have sales, marketing, you know, advertising. And then as we grew, he'd have Sydney. I, I built Melbourne and I'd spent 10 days a month in Melbourne. Eventually that office had 700 people in it. It's a big business, Melbourne, for us. And, Sydney. Sure. and then, we, you know, New Zealand. And so suddenly with, we'd split it geographically. And then when we went public, um, I was probably more the public company uh, officer, the finance director, and myself would probably prepare the investor presentations. Um, Jeff was very strong on public relations and PR, and he did a great job uh, with our agency sort of promoting, so he'd be more promoting, but again, you know, functionally managing different people. Uh, and, you know, the, the public, uh, ate, you know, the, the, uh, the analysts didn't like it. Uh, they, at first, they said, we, we've never heard of a public company being run by joint managing directors. But you have to sort of make it work. And I think because Jeff and I were very analytical about our duties, there was no emotion or stuff. We just did what made sense. It worked pretty well. Yeah. Uh, Got it. So that, that, that journey, that incredible journey from, from 2 to 2000. So my understanding is you, you, you grew quite quickly in the early years. You sold the business. You bought it back. And then ultimately you ended up listing it. So what a journey. How did, how did that all come about? Well, you start in 85, you grow, you, you worry like hell in your first three months you're going to make any money. You charge retainers. We started the idea of charging retainers. The retainer checks were couriered in by some of our loyal clients, which was so nice. You get through that, then you're making money, you're making a profit. And so now we're 86, 87. And as you will remember, late 87, October 87, there was a big... Uh, stock market crash. It was one of the first. And so the whole world got a bit of a shock. We came through that the other side. And then in 88, this public company from England came down, Robert Clapp from Select, made us an offer that sounded pretty good. We'd only been going for four years. You know, how would you like 45 million pounds for your company? 75% uh, cash, 25% stock. You can come on my board in England. I'm a high street sort of uh, secretarial clerical agency, your executive, and we can swap, you know, geographies as well. You can come to the UK, blah, blah, blah. I said, good. And for us, it was a game-changing, life-changing money. So uh, that was fun. I can remember walking out of, because, you know, the lawyers are always getting you to sign warranties and covenants at the last minute. So we're doing that at three in the morning and saying no, and it's all a bit of a gamesmanship <laughs> about whether you'll walk away or not. Well, we, we held our ground and then, by 5 a.m. we're having breakfast, we're walking down a street, you know, thinking, wow, they've just put a big check in their account and let's go and have breakfast. So where do you go? The Ritz, of course. So we went to pick on Piccadilly, you know, and uh, by 6 a.m. or whenever they opened, we were there having having breakfast. So that was fun. Um, but anyway, coming back to that, then by 1990, the whole world was in a bit of a recession. Australia had 14% unemployment. And... Um, uh, for various reasons, Select, the, the parent company, um, had basically been moved on by their bankers. They'd basically run out of cash, a um, okay. bunch of reasons. So 
the bank Barclays, I remember, rang us and said, you can, we want you to uh, buy your company back. We'll sell it back to you. And after about six months of negotiation, and we sent a banker over there, we bought it back for about 5% of what we'd sold it for. So that was pretty cool. Very, very nice. And then, and then how did you get into, into listing, listing the business? Well, that was 1990, 91. The recession yeah. started to end. We could see the process. And we, when we did the buyback, we allowed about 25 of our staff to buy back with us. And mm. they did that. And they had basically shares in an unlisted company. And 92, 93, we were starting to really grow, but we also had a big executive tent business, so contractors, we were up to two, 3,000. So the business was using a lot of cash. And frankly, some of those small shareholders who were good, loyal staff, but they were getting a bit nervous about the fact that they had shares in an unlisted company that was using cash. By this time, we were probably doing 60, 70 million, maybe 80 million in sales. And so it's an interesting lesson where you have to separate ownership from management. Uh, and so we said, well, one of the ways we do that is we go public and then everybody gets a payday or they can keep their shares or not, but they're not locked in. And we spread the risk and we obviously raise cash to grow further. And that's what we did. We floated in 94 uh, at a multiple of eight, I think, which is huge for a service company in those days, but it's still fairly mm -hmm. new. Yeah. And, and how did you select those 25? Um, it wasn't, it, I mean, remember 1990, we're buying the business back. It's tough times. Basically, who won, who had the faith, who had the money, and who was ready to do it? You know, so I think that was really the the key thing. Um, it wasn't it wasn't a very uh, rigorous selection process. They'd been with us a while. They were loyal. They had the money, and, and they were able to write a check. Sometimes they only wrote a check of fifteen or twenty grand, but it was still a lot of money for them. Yeah, and so you you became co um, managing directors of this public listed business. And you know, how did that play out? And was there any power politics involved? You know, people coming to you, people coming to, to Jeff, you know, various stakeholders? Yeah, um, well, any... I think my theory about arguments is, and mm. you might reflect on this, whether it's with your, your significant other or in, in business, there's always a third party. There's always someone else creating friction. And so a few people tried to get between Jeff and I, uh, mm. and, you know, we had a very simple solution. Oh, someone said something, so get him in a room. So right now, repeat what you just said. Jeff's here. I'm here. Repeat it. And, mm. you know, once people realized that Jeff and I were not going to get caught up in those games, they didn't play it for much longer. Um, there was occasional, you know, who do I report to and whatever. But this was the early days of what you and I would call a flat organizational structure. So we tried to explain to people that our version of leadership was not push, but pull. And it wasn't mm. top down command and control. This was, you know, so we said when we hired people, if you can't handle a bit of ambiguity, if you can't handle a bit of a vacuum space in which you have to make a decision and you always need to know who your boss is and what, then you're probably not right for us. So mm. we did mm. create a much flatter structure where, you know, when people say, well, you know, I, I, I don't know, I need a decision. We said, well, you know, what do you think we should do? So, and, and I know that was a bit new in those days. Today, it would be taken for granted if you went to a startup or a Silicon Valley, Valley company. But um, Jeff and I actually believed once we got to, you know, three, four hundred people, how the hell could we make every decision for everybody and get it right, right. all the time? So um, that that helped. Got it. And so maybe now we can we can jump into the next evolution stage, if you like, where TMP and Monster came in and you had your own job or business, I understand, job hound. Um, yeah. And can you just tell us a little bit about that, the size of your business, the size of your job board, yeah. the monster and so on? So we're 1996. Our revenues mm. are now, uh, believe it or not, in two years, they got to four or five hundred million because we had a big, you know, as I said, executive temp payroll. So they're rising yeah. pretty quickly. I think we're growing at about a hundred million a year. And, mm. and we hired a guy from Booz Allen. Um, one of the strategic consulting companies, and he'd heard of the internet. <laughs> we were intrigued. He just he was an Aussie, but he just came back to Australia, and he started to explain it to us. And the way we looked at it was, that's a digital ad. Now, we're spending a lot of money, like everyone else in the recruitment industry, on classifieds and or client paid ads, you know, the, what you'd call the display ads, which were in the, the general news section. So we, yeah. we were spending $25 million a year 
in 96 of clients' money because we were taking half a page or a full page of big ads in five different newspapers all over Australia every weekend mm. and Friday. So, um, and you know, in the UK, they were even more expensive, um, huge, you know, for the Sunday Times, you know, the enormous ad. Anyway, we decided, well, the internet's a very cheap way of getting candidates. So I went down to Melbourne University. I remember there was a guy with long hair and glasses at Melbourne University. He wrote our URL in a book, morganandbanks.com.au. It was quite quaint, really. So what we'd say is, you're advertising for a financial controller. We'll, um, we'll put a display ad in the Financial Review, or if you're the UK Financial Times. And we're also going to run an ad on our website. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's only another 250 bucks compared to $5,000 for the paper ad. So suddenly we're doing two and a half million on our website. It's called Job Hound. And mm. TMP Monster noticed us. And they just, TMP was like a big advertising agency, Neville Jeffers. They own Neville Jeffers around the world. So they were, there. they were like a Yellow Pages, an advertising agency that would place classified ads. And they knew we were a big client in Australia for advertising. And then they just bought Monster Board, which was in... Um, started by a guy called Jeff Taylor in Boston, and he was doing mm. 500,000 a year in revenue. We were doing two and a half million. They were in Boston, the USA. We're in little old Australia. So they thought, well, they must be doing something right. And cut a long story short, we had already developed the idea of charging to access a resume database anonymously, as well as Anson. And so um, we decided to merge their market mm. cap their market cap was 550, I remember, uh, US, and ours in US was about 300. Um, and we, but the, the deal was we wouldn't, we, there was a lot of tax benefits by not taking cash, by making it a pure paper deal, a merger. There'd be all sorts of benefits for both parties, but it was risky. All, we were all stock, all stock deal. All stock deal. So mm. it was, uh, by that time, our revenues, 98. Tonight we're heading towards 900 revenue. We were, I think, I think, I think if you look at our last set of accounts as a listed company, we were 940 million in revenue and making about 50. Mm. And, uh, anyway, so we merged the company. Um, the share price was 29 bucks, I remember, and uh, yeah. we capped TMP's share price because we knew if it took three or four months to do the deal, their share price might take off. So we also did a deal very important for M and A. People cap the share price in case things mm -hmm. move away. That was a big, big deal because by the time we'd done the deal, their actual share price was 55. So we'd capped it at 29. And, Great um, and then Monster took off. Monster mm -hmm. had an incredible run. Um, they did Super Bowl ads, which uh, if people want to check it out, when I grow up, monster.com, it's a great Super Bowl ad with kids. And they ended up getting uh, 60 million resumes and their revenue was like 500,000, 17 million, 150 million, 350 million, 700 million, and a billion in a straight line. Just mm. monster in the US. And you, and you ended up moving to New York, I believe. Yeah, the deal, the deal was Jeff would stay in Australia and New Zealand and be chairman of the Morgan, effectively the Morgan and Banks business. And then I would okay. move with a small team to New York and expand the bricks and mortar part of the business around the world, which is why you would have heard of me in London by Harrison Willis. And, and I did 61 acquisitions from 99 through to 2001, 61 acquisitions in virtually every continent on the planet, including Poland, South America, and uh, Asia. I, d I doubt that's ever been replicated. I mean, it's, it's, that's incredible. That's 20, 30 a year um, across the globe. And, and what sort of team did you have behind you, like internal team, your acquisition team, and the, the sort of corporate finance houses or brokers that were using? How was that all structured? Well, um, do you, I don't know if you remember, Michael Page used to have a great saying, hatch, match, and dispatch. That was about hatch a candidate, match them, and dispatch them. That's kind of funny, mm. but I thought it was quite applicable. So we did a bit of that. I had a team of, of two people who would find the right acquisitions. They'd be out there looking to, uh, to see you know, if, if they were the right sort of mix for us by country. And then um, I'd have people do the due diligence. And we'd, we'd make the call, see if the owner was interested. We had a particularly good story to tell. We had Monster, and the idea was, you, mm. you've got a bricks and mortar business, join us, 
will give you stock in the whole company and you know you've got to stay for at least three years but you will get the benefit of the higher multiple of a digital stock you can have access to monster particularly if you're a u.s recruiting company that is particularly powerful because 60 million resumes online etc mm. um and uh, but you're still kind of uh, you know you're st- and, and we'll create a bit of autonomy in terms of how you run your business but uh, you know that's a, another comment comment because you want to integrate mm. as much as you can without stifling the culture of the company you bought um and you know we were buying with paper too remember we were printing our own money we had a multiple of 90 so we were mm. buying buying companies that were probably privately trading at a multiple of six or seven with paper. So it was a bit of a gamble for them and for us, but it worked. So so two questions around that. So all of those 61 deals were were paper stock only deals. There's no cash involved. Is that correct? Correct. correct. Right. And then and then when you talk about uh, the right sort of deal for you guys, what, what did a right sort of deal look like for you in terms of the size of the business, the, the profitability of the business, well, the shareholder structure, the sector, whatever. Yeah. I think, first of all, we target the geography and the sector. So, for okay. example, if, if we were going into a country for the first time, let's say Poland, we'd go from mm. generalist recruitment or someone really strong in, say, accounting uh, or, or engineering or, or, you know, sales, something, you know, that was mainstream. You wouldn't buy a medical recruiter if that was the first thing you bought or a legal mm. recruiter. If you were going into Sweden for the first time, I don't think you'd start. Well, we took the view and do that. Then you've got to have a receptive CEO. They get it. They, at that time, they would sort of understand the web and the internet. They kind of got what Monster was about and how recruitment wasn't moving to the web, but certainly advertising was moving to the web. So they, yeah. uh, the, they, they weren't putting a ridiculous price on it. And then we evaluate the quality of their people. Uh, and, you know, do we feel they were receptive or were they, you know, I mean, frankly, in some parts of the world, you know, people were very set in their ways. Everything was, you know, they'd write re- candidate reports by hand. I mean, by this time we were dictating into machines. We wanted to have a very uh, process-driven recruitment business that was efficient. It didn't mean we'd take out the, the, uh, the empathy and the personality and style of the place. But we wanted... The receptiveness of, yeah, I'm prepared to change and grow and I can learn from this company. And, mm. you know, uh, so that was my sales pitch, you know, often acquisitions is a sales pitch. Um, yeah. And then, you know, was their upside scope with their margins right? Um, and, uh, you know, all the normal things that you look for if you were doing due diligence to buy any recruitment company. Yeah. And when you look back at those 61 acquisitions, I mean, because it's an incredible number in a short period of time. Um, you obviously can't directly control the stock price and, and, you know, they may or may not have made depending on when they got in, but how, how do you feel they went? I mean, what were the learnings from you from those? <laughs> yeah, I would say I'd give myself seven out of 10 for that period. You know, they didn't all work out. Um, mm. and a few of the people were, few of the, I mean, we got, you, you would say we got conned or we were naive with a few people who said, oh yeah, they love it and they're going to stay forever and they found ways of, getting out within six months, um, mm. no names, but uh, yep. I, I know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, so that was a bit disappointing. Um, if I knew what I knew now, I probably would have bought more companies with a contracting non-perm bias because that's mm. stickier business. Yep. Um, but, you know, uh, generally the, one, the, the bigger ones, the best ones uh, stayed. And... And there were a lot of examples where we grew businesses substantially. For example, in in the legal recruiting industry in the U.S., they hadn't really thought about temporary lawyers. And yet Mm. the U.S. is such a litigious place. You have droves of lawyers going to warehouses doing, uh, you know, um, discovery and stuff like that. So that was a huge, a huge uh, opportunity for us. Um, Mm. And um, I mean, I even had a go at Anderson Consulting was up for sale because Anderson... Uh, you know, accounting had just gone bust with the with the uh, the Enron deal, and uh, and and so and I was very keen to buy them. My chairman was not so keen. So there were a few that I was keen on, and they weren't. So you know, we had the normal boardroom tussles about who should do what. But you know, seven out of ten, they uh, we certainly ended up still being uh, the most profitable part of the business through to two thousand and two. 
Got it. So before we move on to to uh, talent, to um, uh, could you just let us know how things wrapped up with you with TMP Monster? Like why did you, why did you leave? And so uh, the yeah. chairman, who's no longer with us, he he died mm. of pancreatic cancer, sadly, Andy. Oh, uh, um, no, but he was in his seventies. Mm. Look, I, we Jeff and I were very quite large shareholders, as you imagine, because of the market caps. And um, I had done something which I felt was fiscally responsible for me, which is I'd collared my stock. And when you collar mm. a stock, it means you put a cap and a put over it. So I'd gone to Goldman Sachs and they give me it. And so when the share price, I woke up one morning, and my wife were in a, you know, one of those high rise apartments in New York and CNBC's got a program that says, Monster.com's just gone to a multiple of 93 and, you know, the share price is 195 bucks. And I said to my wife, I think I think this is a good time to put some insurance in place. You know, I, <laughs> not, not the world has gone mad, but I mean, it was the it was the bubble before the tech crash. So I put a, I put a uh, collar on, uh, which means you take 5% haircut, but you can't go up more than 10% or something like that. And I said, well, I'm mm. happy if it doesn't go up. I just don't want it to go down. Anyway. Sure enough, within a year, the tech crash had happened. The share price was, you know, down around forty bucks or fifty bucks again, and um, I wasn't very popular. Uh, so because because I wasn't a board director, but you know, I was a senior shareholder, and they they somehow felt that that wasn't the right thing. I hadn't sold the stock; I'd simply protected. So I think the short mm. answer is was one of those things where I'd been there three years. I felt I'd really done my best. I came back to Australia um, after nine eleven had happened, so we didn't really want to stay in. The states after 9/11, it was a tricky time, sure. and um, I, you know, I think, you know, it's one of those cases where they didn't, uh, they didn't feel I had a, uh, a, you know, a role to play unless I was back in New York. I was wanting to be mm. coming back to Australia, so I moved on. It was quite amicable in the end. Um, it, it got a bit difficult when I started Talent too because we didn't approach anyone from Hudson, as it's now called, but a, mm. a lot of people thought that they were all coming to join us and. And uh, poor Anne Hatton, who was the CEO at the time, was accused of doing a deal with me. And they were convinced, uh, you know, hundreds of people were going to join us. And I'd never even spoken to her. And uh, this is all on the record. And Anne, uh, I think, dealt with it through the courts because I think um, they, they jumped to all the wrong conclusions. So mm, anyway, okay. had, a, had a few years off and then um, Talent 2 came along. Yeah, I, and I was interested to learn that that, that was through a... Um, a, a backdoor listing, and I think the IP around the payroll was what really excited you. So, well, living in New York, outsourcing mm. was going on in every format, and you could see mm. how important that was. And I thought, well, what 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 does an outsourced HR department look like? And I guess for small and medium sized businesses that can't afford big uh, HR departments, the answer to that question would be, you know, you hire people, you train them, you induct them. You pay them, uh, and then you know you outsource, <laughs> you outplace them, or or um, you know let them go. So that cycle, I thought, would be a good Rubik cube of a business model. And I found a payroll company called Concept Systems that was listed in Australia, doing about 16 million in revenue and losing money, and a market cap of eight million. So we went and talked to them and said, "Have we got a deal for you?" So Jeff and I put in about eight million dollars, took control of the company, and used that as the base on which to build Talent 2. And then everything else was organic until the latter years we bought a few recruiting uh, training companies. But all the recruiting was, was organic growth because when we put the word out that we were starting to build a new recruiting business, obviously not just ex-Hudson and Morgan and Banks people, but people from the industry uh, took notice. Of course. Uh, you delisted that business as well, did you not? Ah, well, we grew that. So that $16 million business losing money when ended up in, uh, two, in July 07, I think, that we were getting close to $350 million in revenue and about $32 million EBITDA. And then mm. remember 07, 08, Lehman's. Uh, so what happened is we were growing the business and then the share price tanked, everybody sold everything. Um, obviously our revenue, et cetera, was affected. And by... I think the share price had gone from three dollars to forty-seven cents in about three weeks, which is, mm. you know, to me a bit ridiculous. So we thought about it. We we stayed doing what we were doing. The business was still doing okay. It wasn't obviously doing as well because it was the Great Recession, but we were hanging in there and doing all right. Maybe we were still making a profit. 
So we decided to privatise, which is when you buy the business. Now, privatising a public company when you're the major shareholder is not is a tricky business because it, mm. you know all all the other shareholders worry that you're going to try and steal it from them. You want to do it ethically and transparently, but on the other hand, you don't want to pay too much. So, um, and we we got talking to Allegis, which is a huge company in the US. I'm sure most people know about it. It's, a, it's yeah. an amazingly successful organization. Started about the time Morgan and Banks did, but in a bigger market, uh, 10 billion in revenue. And uh, they wanted to come to Asia Pacific. So we said, well, why don't we do it together? We'll privatize together. And then after a couple of years, you can take the rest of our shares. So that's what mm -hmm. we did. Privatized it in 2012. And by 2014, they bought Jeff and I out. And that they, now they own that business. And that, that's really my last operating recruiting business. Mm. Are, are you able to tell us anything about the structure of that deal? Well, the buyout, I think we did the buyout at about 75 cents when the, the shares were trading at 45 or 50, so we gave people a premium. Um, mm -hmm. we, uh, we put in debt, uh, but obviously Allegis uh, being such a big company and we bringing them in, they funded a big part of the debt because uh, that was what was in it for them and they were eventually going to get control from us. Uh, but you know, I think we, we clearly bought the business for probably 30% of what its previous market cap was. Um, mm. We then owned the shares 50-50 for two years um, and proceeded to then do the things you can do in a private company. If you've been a public company, you cut a lot of costs out, you're not listed anymore, you get rid of all your listing costs and you slim down a bit because you've just come through a recession, right? Um, mm. And then... Uh, you know, and then obviously at the end of the two years, Jeff and I got our payout, as it were, for the for our shares, uh, because that means the transaction's over and uh, and we moved on. So, you know, I think we did well out of it, probably not as well as if we'd all sold our shares in July 07, but I mean, that, that, that goes for every, every business on the planet, right? <laughs> That's right. And so would you describe it as a good marriage with the guys from Allegis? Yes, because they... they enable the company to keep going and it still exists today in Asia Pacific. Uh, I don't mm. know how much it's grown since then, but uh, you know, they were a very safe and stable, uh, you know, parent company for the team that we left behind. Mm. And so, so after that, I think you, four seasons of, uh, of, of Shark Tank, I believe. Um, we both know James Kahn, and so he has in some ways a similar background to yourself um, from the UK and, uh, you know, uh, AMS and, and Dragon's Den. Um, so it's really interesting for me to hear a little bit about that and, you know, what your experience was and what you took out of that. Series. Well, okay, so, you know, I went to live in Los Angeles for five years after 2014, just because my mm. kids are over there. Both my children had stayed in America after the New York thing. They'd gone to university mm. there and and uh, had married Americans. So, um, you know, it speaks a bit to someone who's, you know, then in their 60s, what do I do? Do I go on boards? Do I, and I've obviously been investing things for a while. We'd had, Jeff and I had had capital since the late 80s. So we had been investing in companies and real estate. I didn't really want to do public company boards or whatever. And I like the idea of being an angel investor and backing entrepreneurs. And so they found me, they auditioned me on Skype, I think, when I was living in LA. And I thought it's a great way of staying in touch with Australia. Plus it would keep the old brain active because I, I'd have to go and listen to pitches. You arrive in Sydney, go to Fox Studios, they'd have about 120 pitches over 17 days, you know, eight, nine pitches a day. You'd only see two or three go to air. And I found that very stimulating. It, it taught me a lot about lots of different types of businesses. I felt it was constructive because, you know, mm. some reality TV can be pretty awful. But this was basically backing entrepreneurs and, and giving the viewers advice about what we liked about some deals and what we didn't. And so we did four seasons. Channel 10 then lost the franchise from Sony because it didn't pay enough. And, and I was happy after four seasons. I think I invested in about 19 different businesses, of which about eight or nine are still going strong. The others have either gone bust or I've exited. And I'm happy to say, uh, based on what I invested versus what I've got back, I'm, I'm well ahead on points. And I've learned a lot. And I've enjoyed working with those entrepreneurs. It wasn't about, you know, um, being on t TV for the sake of being on TV. It was really what that was my job after I'd sold my operating business. 
phenomenal. And so I know, I know you're a little bit away from recruitment and staffing, um, um, but I, but I'm really curious if you don't mind just sharing your views on where, where you think the industry is going right now. Um, you know, what, what 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 do you think is important for us to to understand? Well, if you think of recruitment, particularly permanent recruitment, but all kinds of recruitment, there's there's two areas that fascinate me. The mm. first is um, the candidate that looks wrong but is right. That's the holy grail. And by that I mean a candidate that you, if you've got their resume, and it, let's say it's an English school teacher and she's had two kids and is now coming back into the workforce, that resume isn't going to get her a lot of interviews, uh, depending on the job. Um, but if you could read her brain chemistry and evaluate her attitude, if you could watch this person for a day or a week, and compared it to all the outstanding people in your company, you'd hire in a heartbeat. So how do you, how do we turn now the fact that unlike 30 years ago, there's probably a couple of billion things called resumes or CVs floating around the cyber world that we live in, um, the World Wide Web. So, so I think the technologies that are around that help do that. So how do you do that? Well, I'm having a conversation with Amazon in Australia this week. Um, You've got, they've got 6,000 people, but that's a t as a company, they're a pretty clever company and they've got great recruitment systems, but they're a good example of a company that could easily profile 600 of their 6,000 and they mm. could devise you know, 60 to 80 behavioral questions that work for them. So these people have been around for a couple of years, they work in your company, they, 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 they like to be managed the way you manage them, they've got the right what we would call cultural and behavioral fit, both intrinsically and extrinsically. In other words, what they like to do and what they're passionate about and also how they fit in with the group. Now, imagine everybody that applies for a job uh, with a company like at Amazon, using them as an example, has to go through that questionnaire. It takes them 15, 20 minutes to complete. Now, the line manager gets a resume or the recruiter gets a resume and something that says 92% match culturally or 15% match. So now the English school teacher who's been out of teaching for two years coming back to the workforce, you know, the resume, now I'm back to dump it in the bin. Oh, she's a 98% match. I think I'll talk to her. Yeah. Mm. She gets hired, becomes a superstar. So, so one of the companies I'm invested in, Compono, which is a global, uh, we call it intelligent hiring system, is a filtering system. And the great thing about it, in my day, that was expensive to do behavioral profiles and tests and nobody would spend the time. Now, because of the digital online SAS software as a service process, you can do it quickly and cheaply. It doesn't cost either the employer much and the candidate doesn't have to spend much time doing it. So I think that's a huge area in this chaotic world of resumes floating everywhere and people moving around. The other thing is, What's the black hole of recruitment companies? I can tell you what it is. It's all those candidates that you screened but didn't place. Mm. You know more about that candidate than anyone else. You know what they'll move for, what motivates them. Maybe you even know they're looking to move and no one else does. That's what I call notes. So it's not the resume which everyone can access. This. And so uh, I, would, I think I told you the story. I was very pleased with myself when I placed 41 candidates in 1986 and billed a million dollars. And I was very busy patting myself on the back. And then I looked at this filing cabinet and realized it had 600 candidates in there that I'd interviewed that year. And I'd only placed 41. And all of those <laughs> candidates had jobs. And I know it's a bit ridiculous, but I was going, so, so I think there's a huge opportunity for technology to help a recruiter keep quick access to all the people they've interviewed in the last one, three, and six months and keep matching them against jobs on their own client base that are either on the client's website or on their own website. So that, because, you know, sometimes we can be a bit lazy. So you come into work and there's a prompt list. Did you know that these five people that are in your private database have just been matched against... Um, you know, these jobs with your clients, you might want to give them a call. Now, you make the call, probably nine times out of ten, it won't lead to a, an interview, but it's a great way of staying in touch with clients and candidates. But, one, but what I'm saying is if, if, I saw, if I said to Robert Walters or to James, 
How would you like all of your recruiters and all your companies to place 10% more people this year than last year? Uh, just think what that would do to the revenue of, of a listed company in the recruitment business. Yeah, absolutely. It's the holy grail. And I'm really glad you, you touched on HR tech. It, it's, uh, it's something um, that's important to me and I've done some personal investing in that space and clearly you have. Um, so thank you for sharing those insights. They're, they're um, spot on. Um, are you doing anything else outside of, um, you know, the, the obvious um, personal stuff? Are you doing any other investing or anything else that's of interest? Oh, I'm, oh, look, I'm an investor in about 20 different companies. I'm in anti-aging. I invested in a company called Juvenescence, which is doing very well in the anti-aging space with Jim Mellon. Because I said to Jim, if I get my money back, that'd be great. But when you've when you've worked out how you know I can turn back the clock on my age and, and be a 90 year old who's still playing golf, I want to be first in line. So I'm an investor in those. I want to. I want to be second. Yeah. But <laughs> interestingly, my daughter, who's a film director in uh, lives in LA, uh, she's just releasing her first film this this month actually in Queensland called Black oh. Sight. But what's interesting mm. is um, I'm writing a TV series and a, and a movie treatment with her. So. You know, uh, some of my creative acting stuff is coming out in my latter years, and I like the idea of telling a story and, and sort of being involved on the producing side. Of, and maybe so, then the trick is we pitch it and we'll see if someone gives us some money to make it. You come full circle, then. There you go. Well, you know, <laughs> the most important thing is you never stop learning and you never stop being enthusiastic about growing. I think that's the key to uh, staying young. Absolutely. Well, thank you for, for, for sharing those really powerful learnings and insights with us. Um, it's been amazing talking to you. I really, really appreciate it, uh, Andrew. And, it's a pleasure uh, to be with you. Yeah, I hope to, hope to meet you in, in person. If you're over where I am, I'm over where you are. It's, you know, the borders are opening up again. So thank you for your time and, um, kudos to you. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank Thanks. You. Take care. Cheers.